Well, one of the rules is I gotta get the mic closer to my mouth. This is a lot of swimming, so let me say something about this. But first, I want to introduce our first filmmaker, Drew Christie, as a film here, the Emperor of Time. He is a writer, he's a director, he's an animator. You might have seen his stuff in the New York Times, in Vanity Fair, and this is his third Sundance. He's kind of a veteran. Please welcome to my bed, Drew Christie. Come on in bed with me, buddy. Nice, okay. What's up, dude? Nothing, man. Welcome from Washington. Thank you. Dude, so I'm assuming this is the first time you have an interview in bed. Yeah, first time. Yeah. So what are your expectations? Uh, I hope to be able to fall asleep at the end of the interview and just take a, na a nice nap. So you expect me to bore you to hell to the point that you fall asleep? Yes. That's excellent. I'm so glad <laughs> to hear that. All right, let's first get into The Emperor of Time. Yes. This is your third movie here. Yeah. You pretty much figured out the formula. Yeah. What is the formula to get into Sunday? Oh, that's tough. I would say uh, it's got to be something that's kind of, it's got to be unique in, I don't know. Okay, it's got to be interesting in some, there's got to be something that makes it kind of just, stand out from other stuff so I always try and make make it there has to be something either visually or story-wise that people haven't really seen before is what I try right I'm not saying I achieve that but that's what I'm trying for what's interesting is I think I read or saw an interview that you did and you talked about that no one really told you how important storytelling is yeah which is ironic because that's like the single the, most important element. It's the key. It's the key. But when you're, if, I feel like when you're going to film school, you're younger, people are like, oh, it's, you, it has to be shot beautifully. It has to do all the stuff. You have to focus on a certain character, whatever. And that's all, of course, very true. But the, but the, but the big linchpin in all of that is that there has to be a good, compelling story that right. pulls people in. And it's always all about story. And I just, I, I, I feel like everyone needs to stress how important like good writing is because that's right. the foundation that the whole house is built. And people kind of forget that. They get tied up in how things look, and which these are all important things. But like, They're important, but it's funny. Like, I mean, how many movies do we see get made in Hollywood with the most expensive equipment, but the crap? Exactly, and it all comes down to the writing and the story, and that's the thing, and you kind of forget. I mean, no one stresses how important that is. Right, exactly. Well, what's interesting, you know, touching on the technology of it, is that you made a film about the oldest piece of film technology, yeah. the uh, Mutoscope? Yep. What is a Mutoscope here? And I'm going to play a little bit of your trailer while yeah. you explain to people what a Mutoscope yeah. is. It's essentially, it was used for like peak shows in early cinema, and it's essentially a flip book machine that you crank, and as you crank it, the, the pages flip, and it just, it creates a little movie and people would put in, a, they used to put in like a penny or a nickel and crank the machine and the little pictures would fly by and it creates a little, it's an old movie player from the turn of the century. What's funny is that it was made to be viewed by one person at yeah. a time. Yeah. Which is exactly what this thing is that I'm holding. And That's I true. You know what's funny you're mentioning this is that as, as I was working on this film, I was thinking that although it is set in the 1800s and the late 1800s, everything it's about is all very modern things. It's all about how we deal with these technologies right. and who the people behind these technologies are. It's like a Steve Jobs type thing. You like, the more you find out about the people behind all these technologies and you're like, how does that affect how your relationship with the technology? So yeah. that's, I feel like there's a lot of modern technological themes in that. You know, it's really um, let's quickly talk about just making this, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it seems so simple. But once I started reading like the actors and the way you shot it and the fact that you, you did it on such an ancient piece of technology, yeah. you know, talk about the process, how long it took, 
from kind of conception to yeah execution. so it took about six to seven months and when I first thought about it I had written the story and I was actually planning to animate it by hand with like maybe pencil or charcoal or ink or something I was planning to do it all by hand the more I looked at this guy Edward Moybridge who it's about his photos the more I, I kind of was like actually it all needs to look like his photos I can't do my own drawings of his of his motion picture photos that just doesn't do it's it's like it doesn't do it any justice it, right. it needs that that look of those old black and white photos and so I thought well I need to actually shoot this live action you know um, with real horses and real humans and all yeah. this other stuff and so th w that scared me at first but then that also really got me excited because I was like oh man I'm gonna have to deal with horses and people and that's gonna be a really challenging and then then I got really jazzed up about that challenge and so because normally I, I mainly only do animations right and so that this was very exciting and new to me to do it live action like that and shoot it you know with you know cameras and people and lights and all that so. yeah now I think uh, we do we need a mic adjustment here we are live at the Airbnb house this is the Adobe pillow talk we're talking with Drew Christie he's got a film here in the festival the Emperor of time and we're live and we're in a bed for the first time I don't think anyone cool. has ever done this we got people already hanging out <laughs> out front they can hear us. We have a speaker. Hello, <laughs> gentlemen. Uh, this is completely normal. It's cool. Uh, all right, so let's pick up. For, oh, by the way, we can also uh, take questions oh, yeah. online. So you can shoot us uh, uh, a question like in the comment section or whatever, and we'll try and get that answered while we're sitting here chit-chatting. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of times people, to get over that first hurdle of like, okay, what am I going to shoot? Yeah. How do you pick a story? Is it easy uh, for you? Or do you have just like a plethora of, of subjects and topic matters that you want to tackle? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, but you know, uh, it, it all comes from me reading. I read a lot, and I'm all, like, the more I read, the more, like, I feel like every single either book or story or article or whatever I read, I feel like each one of those has like a nugget of an amazing story in it. It's like they're everywhere. You just have to, you just have to be like, bringing in the, 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 the information all the time to, to find it because yeah. the stories are everywhere. Like, I feel like practically every, every article I've ever read has like a, an amazing story in it. You just need to start unraveling it. And, and the people, it's always about, you know, it's, there's like the idea that draws you in, but then it's always got to be like, the people have to be interesting. That's yeah. why I did this one. This Moybridge guy is so strange. And I mean, like he murdered a guy and he got off. I won't, go, I won't tell you much more, but he murdered a dude and got off. I mean, that sounds like the season three of Serial. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly. Like super rad. Yeah. Um, tell me about your first break. Do you remember the first time where people outside of your friends and family started noticing your work and you're like, oh, hell, this, I could maybe like make this a thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was actually when I got into Sundance 2012 uh, with a short animation I did called Song of the Spindle. And um, did you think you were getting in or was it just like, a long share? Like, oh, it was a total long share. I forgot I even submitted. I had gotten this thing in my email like, oh, here's some film festivals to submit to. Here's Sundance. And I think I had time to submit to Sundance. Did it. Went to Montana. Worked on a documentary with my friends. Completely forgot about it. Got home. Was going to Thanksgiving at my parents' house. My car broke down. I was getting some phone calls. And I was like totally stressed out. And I was like, who is this calling me? I don't care who this is. I'm stressed out. I didn't even answer it. Didn't listen to my messages. Had Thanksgiving with my parents. Then I got a kept getting these calls and then finally I picked it up and it was this it was a programmer from Sundance uh, Emily Doe and she said that uh, I'd gotten in to Sundance I was like what I had completely like forgotten that I had submitted because I didn't even I figured I wouldn't get in anyway so who's the first person you call well I was at my parents house for Thanksgiving so I just went downstairs and told them right. um, but yeah who who did I call I think I called my friend who did the sound on it, the music. He did yeah. the music, Spencer. And so I called him and told him, and then he was like, whoa, that's crazy. And so, yeah, it, and, then at, and then through that, I, I, uh, through being in Sundance 2012, I got started doing work for the New York Times, and that really um, opened a lot of doors and got it so a lot of people saw, uh, you know, what I do and how I tell stories and that sort of thing. So Yeah. So we have a question, okay. uh, online question, from New Moon, from the Gazelle, New Moon Gazelle. What up, Gazelle? How do you keep track of all of your ideas? I often find myself all over the place rather than focused. 
How do oh. you keep trying? You know what? Here, Karen, come back here. We're going to do this. That's I'm a gonna good pull question. This mic. I love being live. Yeah. Being live is the raddest. Yeah. Sorry, this sounds probably really horrible coming out of my shirt. Karen? Thank you, Nimi and the Gazelle. So the question is, how do you keep track of all your ideas? I often find myself being all over the place rather than focus on one thing at a time. The organization That's, is the worst. I feel you on that. I'm I'm horribly disorganized, but one thing I do do like to do every day is I make lists. And so I make like the list where I have my stupid chores to do, like annoying stuff. Yeah. Then I have bigger lists with all my kind of like like things I want to do for like that month or that week. And then I'll, I usually put a lot of like story ideas in there, the things that I want to explore. And then I do, I'll even have like another list where it's like the things I want to like try and fit in like that year or the, the projects that I think, or stories that I think are really, really, I can't forget. I don't want to forget. And I start, and I just kind of start chiseling away at them. This one for Emperor of Time, I'd, I'd written down that I wanted to do in a sketchbook six years ago. And I just got around to it last, just in 2015. So, I mean, they sometimes they take a really long time to get around to, but I just say keep, keep a notebook or sketchbook, write them down in there, and just keep coming back to them and refining them and thinking about them. Because, yeah, it's just all about writing it down, because otherwise it just drifts away into the right. ether, you know? I, I I'd like to add on to that. Like, don't get stressed out if you don't finish the list, right? Totally, totally. Sometimes you can be like, oh, I didn't get through everything. I never get through everything. It's never. impossible to finish a list. No, but the list is just there to, to remind you and keep you on track. You're never going to check off all the things. Right, you know? exactly. Um, you live in Washington. You live in on, on an island in Washington. Hold on, I, yep. think I, have a, I think I have a picture here it's true. Of, <laughs> of this said island. And there's like a very specific reason why you live kind of more remote. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I like, I always wanted to live on an island because I like islands. I just like the idea of an island where... Whid Whidbey? Whidbey. Whidbey. It's Whid named for like a, a British like uh, captain or, yeah, a British captain in the eight, 1800s. What is, uh, what, what's life like on... Wib Wibby Wid Wibby Wibby. <laughs> What's life like on Wibby? It's good. I uh, I have my studio on my property, and I walk from the house to the studio, and uh, I have. Uh, is it like a? Are there? Is there like a ton of people? Like how many people live on Wib Quite Wibby. a few. Quite Wib a few. Wibby Wibby Wibby. Wibby. Quite a few. Like I feel like it's got to be. It's probably like fifty thousand. Okay. It's quite a few. Um. I mean, I could even do with even less people on the island, but you know, I like I like my solitude and I like being surrounded by the trees and the water and all that. And I, it's a short 15-minute ferry ride to the mainland, and then right. I, I'm close to Seattle. I, my wife and I used to live in Seattle. So you have to take a boat to get off the island. That's well, there's a there's a bridge at the top, but that doesn't make sense for me to get to Seattle because that's like more north. That'd be like if I was going north towards like Canada. Gotcha. But yeah, you could take you could drive over a bridge. There's a bridge at the top. Okay, so I have uh, let's see, I have five five questions here. Okay. I want to ask every filmmaker that comes in. Here. Okay. Um, and you know, just answer them to the best of your ability. Whatever comes to you first. What do you do or where do you go when you need uninterrupted creativity? That's oh, uh, driving in the car, driving in the car, by myself in the car. That kind of kickstarts your, your yeah. brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. To get stuff done, to be like super productive, do you stay up late to work or do you get up early? I used to stay up late. Now I get up early. And why do you think you switched that? Uh, well, I I used to drink a lot, so that uh -huh. that that fed into the staying up late. So and now you just drink in the morning. Yeah, I used to do that too. I don't do that anymore. But uh, yeah, now now I find that like because so few people are up early in the morning, and I'm not the the more the day goes on, the more I get like emails and text messages from people asking me to do stuff. Yeah. So, like, that doesn't happen from, like, 7 to 9. No one's calling me or doing anything. And there's no distractions. There's no distractions. Yeah. Um, what's a creative killer to stay away from? 
Whoa, that's that's a really tough one. I would say um, I feel like if I if I if I mm, sometimes you can be kind of like overwhelmed by stuff that's really good and it crushes your confidence. So like so I like if you watch something, I, you I, see I've, someone. Sometimes else. I'll watch like like uh, some amazing film and I'm just like, oh my god, I could never, I can't do that. And so sometimes I I'm like that might be too good. I'm gonna stay away from that. Don't want to like get uh, have my confidence crushed. So you encourage people to watch that, or you say stay away from that? Watch it and say it's cool they make it. I can still do me. Yeah. Or avoid it altogether. Maybe avoid it altogether. Okay. <laughs> Don't watch anything. Don't watch anything. Only crap films. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you'll you'll be like, I could do better than this, and then you'll make your own thing. What? Yeah. What's like the biggest? What's your biggest fear when making a film? Uh, doing something that, just embarrassing yourself, embarrassing myself, definitely. Like, I don't want to embarrass myself or anyone else. And so, like, you always want to take risks and do something that's, like, interesting that you haven't seen. But you also don't, just don't want to embarrass yourself. Right. So it's a fine line sometimes. Uh, and then finally, what do you think is a subject or a topic that will be or should be covered more in 2016? Whoa, that's a really good question. Um, I think what will be covered more is artificial intelligence stuff um, and, and, and drones and how we interact with these technologies and how these technologies shape uh, our current culture. What I think should be covered more is um, uh, history because I just love historical stuff and I feel like there's so many interesting stories in history that can be mined and made to be relevant now. Yeah. I think we have another question. We have Karen, the producer. Karen. Final question. Is there anything you would like to try that you haven't already in terms of creativity, like working with a video game company or adapting a comic book into a film? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. I actually am working on my own comic book right now and I would like to adapt that into a film and it's actually about a, it's, it's inspired by a guy who started a real cult uh, in the 1920s and he had a jazz, a famous jazz band with his cult and a baseball team with his cult ah, and all amazing. this other stuff and they, um, you can, you can look, you can, you can look them up, it's called the House of David and they had big beards and they had a traveling baseball team and a jazz band. And I, so they would play like other cults? They, no, they, their baseball team would play um, other big like tra legit ba baseball, baseball teams. teams. Yeah, and like Satchel Paige played on their team as a, like a ringer. And like their jazz band was well known and like they, they wrote their own songs and all this stuff. So like they, would, they were like it, out in the culture. I think it was their form of like missionary work or something, you know, like ah, getting like. Spreading all, the word. Exactly. And they had, a, they had a huge zoo and an amusement park and all this other stuff. But like, like all good stories, there is a downfall. But I won't tell it here, but I'm working on a comic book for that. So yeah, I want to get into like, it's like a graphic novel. So I want to get into that and then adaptation of that. I, I love all sorts of books. So I, I love to adapt a, a book or a graphic novel or comic or that sort of thing. But yeah, I don't, I don't play a, any video games. So I don't know if that'd be a good realm for me, just being having such little knowledge of it. But, but definitely, yeah, comics for sure. Well, I want to thank Drew for stopping by. Maybe we'll see this adaptation next year. At yeah, Sundance. yeah. Uh, can when will the movie be available for people to check out once it got it's yeah. done with the festival circuit? Yeah, I I'd, I'm he I would be hesitant to say exactly, but it, once it's through its festival run, it will be online okay. somehow. You'll be able to watch it online. The Emperor of Time is a film. This is Drew Christie. He's from Washington. He's at Sundance. Thanks for hanging out in the Adobe Pillow Talk, man. Thanks, Tyler. This is sweet. Yeah. And uh, we'll have filmmakers all day and throughout the festival, so come back and check us out. Awesome, man. Sweet, man. How was that? that was